Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is GearWire Crosstalk, episode number 33B, part two of two of a series called Back to Basics, where we take you, either beginners or pros, back through the introduction to recording. This is basically part two of our 101 series on uh, getting started, solving some basic studio problems that a lot of people may have. And uh, without further ado, let's dive right into that. Yeah! Oh, and of course, it's important for me to mention that I'm joined by Drew Craig. Hey, what's up, guys? And Chubbs Weatherald. Chubbs. Chubbs. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, so the second part of our Back to Basics special edition, uh, we're going to talk a little about feedback issues and feedback issues that you see sometimes on the stage or in the studio and how you can, how you can basically uh, counter that, what mm. you can do about feedback. Chubbs, what do you think? <laughs> well, well um, you can... In live situations, there's a standard, like there's a real standard practice because you're using um, basically like you know, bandy cues, like mm -hmm. 32 bandy cues, where you notch out frequencies. It's called ringing out the room. It's where you take a microphone at the front of the stage and you ring out. It's generally like 1k or whatnot to avoid feedback. It's very like first thing you learn when you go do live sound is how to ring out a microphone, and that avoids a lot of the feedback issues. Also, set <laughs> setting up your microphone in a certain area that's not going to interfere with the actual directionality of your speakers. Like your front of house or your monitors and stuff like that generally have like a radius that they spread at when the sound's pushing and your microphone has a pattern. Like uh, most microphones in this situation are gonna be cardioid, which means that you know it has a 180 degree radius with a small knob. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, can we like do some post editing and just be like, <laughs> Cardi um, cardioid uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways but like <coughs> that will avoid a lot of your free like that's how you avoid feedback issues that and like make sure your toms are rung out properly it's another thing that will feed back you know your guitars and your bass don't really have that problem because they're lower and then mid -fre mid range frequencies so it's like you don't need to suck out you know certain bandwidths from that but you take those those uh that uh you know, 32, 34 band EQ, and then you ring out, you know, the toms and the mic, you, you're good for the rest of the show. You gotta do it for every mic at every position, and that's like standard. That's what you do, it's you suck it out. And basically, this is why you get a uh, frequency analyzer in most live situations, mm -hmm. too, is because you sit there and you pink the room, all right? You run basically pink noise or white noise. I think it's pink noise. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time since I've done this, all right? <laughs> But you take noise, you run it through the monitors, you find out which one's causing it to feedback, you suck it out, and then you bring out the mics again properly based off of that reading. Okay. What about feedback eliminators? Uh, do you have a opinion? I've never that? even used, like, I was, no. I, I, I may be a little old, but, like, they started introducing consumer feedback filters, like, right after I got out of school, and I haven't done live sound in, on a huge level for a long time. So mm -hmm. it's, I honestly think you don't really need them if you just know how to do some very standard proper things because that's yeah. essentially what it is is an automatic filter set to a certain frequency and it it's, automatically it's more of a oh my god save my ass type yeah. of tool rather than taking the proper precautions initially to look at the room because every single room is a little bit different yeah. so every room has its bias it's certain frequencies that jump out and or may not jump out and that those are the frequencies you're trying to locate and eliminate because those are the frequencies that would be have a tendency to feed back more mm. You know I, mean? I mean, and also just using your limiters properly is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, like not like when you you ha use peak limiters to make sure that it doesn't reach above a certain level. You know what I mean? Like so, like instead of like using them as like a you know one-off compressor when you're in a tough situation, you take your stereo channels and you limit them to a certain point because if they get too loud, then they're going to bleed over and cause feedback. And that's why you set your limiters up so when the lead vocalist, you know. Guitar players like, man, I need more signal. He pumps up the volume on his thing. <laughs> you know, you have that brick wall limiter to just be like, no, you're not getting much louder than that. Yeah. You know <laughs> what I mean? So, because like it, people are going to hear his rig on stage. Like the whole reason why you mic, you know, those things is to get a little bit of a mix. Most of the time, most small venues where you're doing under 300 people, you don't even need to mic any instruments outside of the drums and the vocals. And mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, like, if he wants to turn up his guitar rig, fine, whatever. You know what I mean? You've already rung out everything and did everything, and your limiters are there, so you don't over, you know, you don't get that feedback situation. Right. So it's like setting up your precautions and ladders. 
Yeah. Well, like in the last section, this is uh, this is kind of new to me as well. The only thing that I've ever you know really mic'd as far as live sound was uh, uh, I used to do live sound for a mime show, <laughs> and uh, so I never really had to mime it, mic anything. But uh, that's a good segue that, into that was into almost studio that production. was almost funny. That was almost <laughs> funny. Yeah, that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> Time out. But Time uh, out. Time <laughs> out. Time out. <laughs> no, we're still going. We're That's still that, rolling. That was not. I, I think everybody wants to see that. <laughs> um, but that kind of it's a good segue now in, into into studio production. And I think that you know because it's a controlled environment, uh, you may not need to deal with feedback as often. Um, you wouldn't think about it being a problem in the studio if you right. have a proper talkback situation. Right. You know, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. However, let me explain just something that happened to me a couple weeks ago. Was this at the uh, Mime show? No, no, it was right after. Actually, okay, we were gotcha. tracking in our studio. We were doing some yeah. vocals. And um, I, wasn't, I wasn't in charge of it. I was just in the other room. But I, I heard this high-pitched noise coming out of the studio. <laughs> and I went in there, and there's nobody in there. But um, there's feedback. And immediately, the first thing I do is I turn down the monitors, but there's still feedback. And I'm going what the hell is going on, you know? And then I realized the headphone levels were actually so loud uh. because some people like to track with real he loud headphones. They were s mm. cranked so much, and we were using such a, a, a sensitive mic. We were using a condenser tube microphone, I believe, um, that when he put the headphones down on the table next to the microphone, it slowly started a feedback loop. And that really freaked me out because, I mean, that could technically damage the microphone. Um, it could damage other equipment, too. And it was, right. it was those, are, those are simple things that you... <laughs> you can avoid with just like common sense of like you exactly. know exactly. I mean this, but you also know. need somebody in the control room. I mean, like the thing is, is that most of the time, like after you're done using like a like a mic or something like that, you set your levels on the board, track it, mm -hmm. and then you mute the mic. <laughs> you, just, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, like these are certain things that you do, or in your headphone mix, you turn down the headphone mix. You know what I mean, and stuff like that. I mean, you don't really. N I mean, like it, I hate the uh, my critical analysis of like feedback issues in the studio i'm like what are you running into yeah, like, right. how loud are you playing something in a in a small environment like even in the bigger studios they i've never seen this have to be an issue because mm -hmm. it's like you plug even when you're micing a cab yeah the cab may be 100 db or whatever but they take a you know a mic that can handle the spl level plug it in it's in its own room bam play 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 you stop playing there's there's no guitar right next there to cause the feedback mm -hmm. so there's mm -hmm. no feedback loop in progress yeah. um there's times where you want feedback in certain <laughs> songs in certain sure. situations but it's a little bit different <laughs> right i think uh you're the issue that happened to you with the feedback coming from that other well i have to say i wasn't uh, engineering that session myself well, but but i did kind of come across it and it really scared funny, me you know what would be funny out. is to get like one of those little pocket amps like a like a cigarette yeah amp, yeah yeah and uh Set up something like a, you know, put an MP3 player in or something with, with a, a feedback sample, <laughs> and you just hide it under their console. <laughs> oh, that'd be dangerous. Yes. I like it. I'll do it. You should yeah, do that. I will. You should do that. That's good. All right. So the next part of our Back to Basics special edition GearWire Crosstalk show or program uh, is about uh, guitar recording. And uh, sometimes you may get, uh, may get a sound when you're starting out that uh, doesn't really sound like what you hear when you're playing the guitar. Why does what goes on tape sound different than what you're playing, and why does it sound really bad? Um, there are a ton of elements which go into this equation, um, yeah. which these guys know a lot more than I do. Um, so we'll go to uh, we Mr. Should, Drew Craig and should then Mr. Chubbs. We broaden it Chubbs slightly, because I think this question isn't so much a question about guitar, because that's, <laughs> that's kind of tricky. This question, I think, is more about signal path than anything else, and just understanding <laughs> what you need to do to, to get a good quality sounding recording in the end mm -hmm. result. And... Less is usually more. I like to start, you know, if I'm recording electric guitar, you know, just guitar into the amp and then microphone on the amp directly into the, you know, whatever I'm recording on to just keep it real simple. Um, obviously, mic placement makes a huge difference. The type of amp, the settings on the amp make a huge difference. So there's a million things right there that could make it sound like crap. You know, it yeah. might be the settings on your amp. It could be your mic placement. You know, it, it could be the settings on your guitar. It could even be, I think more, more often than not, I think the most important, and we could talk about this, I think the most important thing um, is mic placement. Namely, if you get a bad yeah. mic placement, it's going to sound like shit, no matter what kind of amp you have. You know what I mean? So. Well, also, you want to be able to you know, coil your cables, cables correctly after you're done. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, could, I could go off about how like, this whole home studio sort of thing has ruined like, a lot of like quality in recording is degraded the process i mean like here's the thing is that like you're dealing with not 
you're not dealing with as much quality equipment and you're going for something that sounds completely different than what the amount of, and what your equipment can do. So you like kind of, before you even lay anything to tape, before you even plug your guitar in, you're like, oh, I got this idea. And you think you're hearing this through this amp. You, I mean, like a lot of this has to do with the psychology of what your brain's hearing. That's why these people spend like, you know, thousands of dollars on these triple rectifiers, which just sound like solid state distortion anyways at a certain point. You know what I mean? Like they, they spend this money on these amps just because they think they're getting a perceived sound. And then when they actually go to record it with a SM57 off access with no room mic, with a crappy preamp that they bought for $50 at XYZ, <laughs> and then on top of it all, compress the heck out of it and don't even open it up, suck out all the top end of it, and now you have, well, what is the sign? <laughs> it's because you didn't do any, you did everything wrong and you did not, you did not have any conception of what sound, ha like how sound interacts with the gear that you have. And like the thing is, is you can do good recordings with crappy equipment, yes, mm -hmm. but you can also, fuck up everything possible faster with crappy equipment it just means it's more finicky mm -hmm. all right like cheap home studio recording has opened up the door for thousands of musicians to get their stuff out which is awesome but at the same time it's also going to sound like ass crack because you're using crappy shit all right <laughs> so like you got to kind of like level yourself out to like what am i really going to get out of my equipment now you plug in your amp and you plug in your mic and you figure it out and then you can go with like axis off axis sound recordings don't ever mic anything at the center of your cab because the center of your cab is no sound you always plug it in you know and you put your mic uh, like maybe 180 degrees off axis or 90 degrees off axis from the top or the bottom 12 inch if you're using a 12 inch or 10 inch driver um if you're using like a 15 or an 18 inch for bass you take it and you move it a little bit to the side so you actually get some of the movement of the coil all right, you'd get a room mic, get a condenser. It does. I mean, again, you know, you can get good sound recording out of bad shit. It's even better if you have good stuff. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, what you got to do is you actually got to get a room mic, so you actually get the tone that you think you're hearing when you're actually playing the damn thing. Mm -hmm. See, like, you know, putting a mic close up to a thing, you're blowing, like, you're really heavily making the diaphragm move. But then when you stand five feet back and you think, man, it sounds cool. Why well, you put a mic up there? You know what I mean? Then you blend the signal. And then you, you know, then there's other things that you can do that are like other processes that you'll figure out like signal and gain. Don't overload your preamps on, on in these cases because you're running high SPLs through them anyway. So you want just enough gain to probably be hitting kind of in that z like zero range. I would even go under zero, about minus five on digital, um, you know. Absolutely. You know, because Let's zero is absolute. <laughs> well, there's, well, there's absolute zero. There's other things that people don't take into account for. It's like when you're dealing with digital signal versus analog. If you have an analog 8-track machine, more power to you. But zero is where you want everything because you got five. You got plus five mm -hmm. on dB. All right? So you got nice tape compression going on. Mm -hmm. Some of that good harmonic distortion that will happen in between that plus five and zero. But zero on a digital is zero. There is nothing past it. There is no headroom. There's no nothing. Even the limiters, like there is limiting um, circuits on all the preamps and digital stuff. But still, zero makes it that nasty, really harsh. So you always want to go up to zero or tap it a little bit. That's why you have the little red meters on like Pro Tools and stuff like that. It means that you're like getting close to zero. It's actually, you know, not zero. But when you keep it at the red and then you keep on turning it up, it's like, <coughs> yeah. you know, and you hear that farty noise and whatever, and, you know. That's the best way to describe what I've ever heard before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, like, it's just like, <coughs> and it just kind of farts out and you're just like, man, I, it doesn't sound cool. Well, it's cause you didn't, you know, you didn't tastefully like actually measure your signal. The easiest way to explain all of this signal processing and gain is, is it's like g several gates of water for a dam, all right? You get like a, you have a river and you have gates for each one, so each dam. And like you open up the gate for your preamp gain, like you're just your actual signal gain, and you open that up a little bit and you only have that much water flowing. So if you open it up all the way, then you have to, like, you know, you have to close the other one. And basically you want everything to be at zero most of the time. That's what a, ideally, Theoretically, a perfect recording would be is if you could set your fader at unity and not have to move it. Mm -hmm. It never really happens that way. It's not, you know, <laughs> this, is the, this is the theory behind recording. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you got to 
actually adjust everything appropriately so you're getting the right amount of signal down all the way back through to your speakers. So like don't twist the, you know, preamp, you know, gain on it all the way up and then expect it to sound good. No, you got to fiddle with it and see mm -hmm. how it's going. I think uh, like what you said a few minutes ago, I think the one really important point is just knowing the gear you have. Like mm -hmm. you could, might not have the best gear in the world, but if you know it inside and out, you, you know, and have the information, you can make it sound good. Like I've produced some excellent sounding recordings on a four track, you know, but it took me years of working with that four track to really get to know how it sounds if I put it on zero or if I was cranking it a little bit less or a little bit more and get, get the different characteristics of, of how it sounds and really get it inside and out. So that, I mean, that just goes to show if you have some crappy gear, don't just throw it away, you know, mm -hmm. see if you can learn more about it and how to use it and make it work, you know, in your environment. Well, it begs also the question of like what engineering is down to its basic concept. And a lot of musicians kind of, and I've done this before, we all do it, where we're like, yeah, I'm, a, you know, I'm playing and I'm going to record my own album. And so you're playing and you're focusing so hard on the actual notes and the production mm -hmm. value of it all. You lose that an engineer has no, there's nothing about what's being played. It's about how it sounds in relation to everything else. So yep. it's not notes and, and things like that. You're looking at frequencies and spectrums and, and mm -hmm. com like compression and placement in the you know, actual room of things, uh, such as your panning and whatnot. And that has nothing to do with the notes. So you don't, you actually just stop listening to the music as far as chord changes and stuff is concerned. You start listening to you know harmonic content. And I think a lot of people forget about that. So they're so caught up in that thing. So why doesn't my guitar sound good? Well, it's because you've done everything to not listen to the fr frequency content and did everything to just play your fucking guitar. Retard. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that's a good. I think that's a good place yeah. to end it right there. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks for listening, everybody, and watching. We will uh, see you next time. Peace. Oh yeah.